it's really exciting to see the momentum behind Android Wear. But for me, what's fascinating is that when you take a traditional device like a watch and you add computing and connectivity and a layer of intelligence to it, you end up transforming that experience. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that for more devices? If we could connect more devices, the devices that you run into in your day-to-day -day life, things like parking meters, washing machines, airport kiosks, if we could get physical devices and connect them in a smart way to the internet, we think we can transform the experience for users. We call this the internet of things. And there are a whole range of possibilities you can imagine. The most common thing that gets talked about is the smarter home. Imagine you're driving in, your garage door, your lighting, your blinds, your music, all working together to create a better home maybe save energy in the process. But the possibilities go well beyond that. You can imagine a farmer managing the entire farm from her smartphone. The security cameras, the sensors, the irrigation equipment, all of them can be connected so that it works better together. A city's public transportation system, buses, bus schedules, parking spots, you could manage traffic, maintenance, and create a much better experience for people living in the city. So we see a range of possibilities, and we think it's endless. But there are a whole lot of challenges. Today, people are making connected devices, like smart light bulbs. But it's really hard for device manufacturers, just like in early days of smartphones. You don't know exactly how to build your software stack. Developers don't know how to target these experiences. And finally, for users, it is really confusing to make all of this work together. We are fortunate to have Nest. Nest has been working hard at taking traditional devices in the home and reimagining them for users. They've already done that with the thermostat and the smoke detector, and they've been very, very successful. So we have worked, collaborated closely. We have pulled in people from the Nest, the Android, and the Chrome OS teams to take a fundamentally new approach to the Internet of Things. And we want to provide an end-to-end -end complete solution for our ecosystem. And to do that, we needed to think through all the building blocks. You need the underlying operating system. You need a communications layer so that the devices can talk to each other seamlessly. And finally, for, use, for users, it has to be a simple and elegant experience. So I'm very excited to announce today we are announcing Project Brillo, which is the underlying operating system for the Internet of Things. Brillo is derived from Android, but we have taken Android and polished it down, hence the name Brillo. We have, this is basically the lower layers of Android, the kernel, the hardware abstraction layer, the real core essentials, so that it can run on devices with a minimal footprint, things like door locks. Because it's derived from Android, you get full operating system support, things like connectivity. You have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth low energy built in, and working with Nest, we are adding support for alternative connectivity like, like Thread so that there are low power wireless solutions as well. We have thought about security from the ground up. And given it's based on Android, you get immediate scale. Many, many device manufacturers can use it. In addition, we provide device manufacturers can manage it from a centralized management console. They can provision these devices. They can update them and so on. So it's an end-to-end -end functioning operating system. The next step is what we call as Weave. Weave is the communications layer by which the Internet of Things can actually talk to each other. You need a common language, a shared understanding, so that devices can not only talk to each other and to the cloud and to your phone. So what we are doing is we have standardized schemas Schemas are nothing but a semantic blueprint uh, for all these devices to have a common language. For example, a camera can define what does it mean to say take a picture, and all devices around it can understand that. A door lock can define lock and unlock as two phrases which all other devices in that ecosystem can understand and work off each other. So we will have standardized schemas, 
developers can submit custom schemas, and we will have a Weave certification program to make sure anything that is Weave certified can work together. Weave is available cross-platform. So you can use this as a modular approach. You can have Brillo and Weave together, or you can run Weave on top of your existing stack. And very, the powerful thing is Weave exposes developer APIs in a cross-platform way. So if you're writing a recipe application on your smartphone, the actual application can now turn on your smart oven, set it to the right temperature, right? And any connected device, your oven can be voice-enabled easily because we provide voice APIs as part of this. The final thing we are doing is getting the user, user interface right. So because this is built into Android, any Android device will recognize another device based on Brillo or Weave, and as a user, you get the same standardized setup for any connected device. You open up your phone, we detect it, you choose the device and set up the right owners, and you're good to go. So, <laughs> this is the beginning of, beginning of a journey. Just like we have done Android for smartphones, we are doing this for the entire ecosystem together. Brillo goes into developer preview in Q3 of this year. And we, we are going to announce documentation throughout the year, and we are working with developers, and the full stack will be ready to go by Q4 of 2015. And so we are very excited that for the first time, we are bringing a comprehensive end-to-end -end solution, and we hope we can connect devices in a seamless and intuitive way and make them work better for users. You've heard us talk about how the phone is enabling a multi-screen world. You've heard about other form factors like Android Wear, um, and connected devices, and how the phone is at the center of this digital experience. Now, we want to talk about how we, as Google, we are improving the experience on the smartphone. To do that, we go to the core of what Google set out to do. Our core mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And we've been doing that for a while. Think about how far search has evolved from the 10 blue links. If you're in a modern mobile phone, you know, you can ask a question like, what does Kermit's nephew look like? And you get the answer instantly on your smartphone for your Muppets fans out there. In fact, you can even ask, what does Kermit the Frog, how do you say Kermit the Frog in Spanish? Kermit la rana. You know, in this query, what looked like a simple query, we understood voice, we did natural language processing, we are doing image recognition, and finally translation, and making it all work in an instant. The reason we are able to do all of this is thanks to the investments we have made in machine learning. Machine learning is what helps us answer the question, what does the tree frog look like, from millions of images around the world. The, you know, the computers can go through a lot of data and understand patterns. It turns out the tree frog is actually the third picture there. The reason we are able to do that so much better in the last few years is thanks to an advance in a technology called deep neural nets. Deep neural nets are a hierarchical layered learning system. So we learn in layers. The first layer can understand lines and edges and shadows and shapes. A second layer may understand things like ears, legs, hands, and so on, and the final layer understands the entire image. We have the best investment in machine learning over the past many years, and we believe we have the best capability in the world. Our current deep neural nets are over 30 layers deep. It is what helps us when you speak to Google, our word error rate has dropped from 23% to 8% in just over a year. And that progress is due to our investment in machine learning. It is what helps us when users type queries like sunsets and lightning, we return the exact right images to users instantly. This insight is what we will use to help organize users' photos. Uh, and you'll hear about that in a minute. As a next step, we want to take all these advancements we have made and in the context of mobile, be a whole lot more assistive to users. We want to give users this information 
even before they know they need it. We want to give it to them in context. If you take a product like Google Inbox, and you're planning a trip to London, we bring together all the information in one place, and it is waiting, ready to go for you. It has all the details to do with your London trip. Google Now lets you know when to leave before you actually need to go for home based on traffic, et cetera. Or if you reach the airport, we have your boarding pass ready to go. We are beginning to think about how to advance all of this further to work better for users. In mobile, the need is even greater. You're deluged with a lot of information on your phones. Even a simple use case, like if someone pings me and says, can we meet at the restaurant I emailed you about? I need to open my email, search for it, figure out a way to book that all while I'm on the go. Small use case, but every day you have many, many moments like that. So we are working hard to be more assistive to users. To talk about how we are doing that, I'm going to invite Aparna from the Google Now team. Thank you.